In 2010, the Schwieberts were holding their family reunion in Kirchbostede, an hour away from Hamburg in Germany. As a child, I had remembered my grandmother talking at length about her travels to Germany and how one of the highlights of two of her trips was when she and my grandfather attended the Passion Play in Oberammergau. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the history and lore of the Passion Play at Ober Oberammergau, in 1633, the residents of Oberammergau, Bavaria, Germany, vowed that if God spared them from the bubonic plague ravaging the region, that they would produce a play thereafter for all time, depicting the life and death of Jesus. So now get this. The death rate among adults rose from one person per 1,000 per year in October 1632 to 20 a month in the month of March 1633. The adult death rate slowly subsided to one in the month of July 1633. So the villagers believed that they had been spared, and they kept their part of the vow when the play was first performed in 1634. So word spread throughout the region about the play. I'm sure a lot of people were praying for this to happen in their regions as well. But it became too expensive to perform every year, so the town decided that every 10 years that would be sufficient. So now the play is performed repeatedly over the course of five months during every year ending in zero. And, and then if there's a five in there somewhere. But 2010 was a scheduled year for a performance. Family reunion, anyone? Oh, and did I mention that this passion play is over six hours long? So can you imagine 102 performances times six times five months? Anyway. I digress, but I was excitedly told my husband, Andy, that we needed to go to Oberammergau and see the Passion Play since we were already there. His response? Six hours? Why do we need to go and see the Passion Play of Christ when I already know the ending of the story? <laughs> we always think that we know the ending, and we think that six hours of sitting for a play is a long time. But we get to Easter, but we have to go through Holy Week, the length of Holy Week first. And the passion starts with a man riding into town on a humble beast of burden. As we begin the, with Palm Sunday and enter into Holy Week, let us go in with new ears to hear and experience Christ's life again. Let us think on these things. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts, may they be acceptable in thy sight, our God, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Okay, of course we went to Oberammergau. And as pastors, Andy and I found the experience of watching the Passion Play one of profound sadness, one of greater understanding, one of extreme awe, plus years of worthy theological conversation. In a production that involves over 2,000 performers, musicians and stage technicians, all residents of the village, how could it not be? And for us, it was the crowds that helped us to set up the scene of the passion. Today, the crowd sets the scene and celebrates Palm Sunday. As we read and mark, the people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread branches that they had cut in fields and laid them on the road before Jesus, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of the ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Or for those of you who need a translation of that from the book of Andrew Lloyd Webber, Hosanna, hey, Zana, 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 Hosanna. Hey, JC, won't you smile for me? Zana, Hosanna, hey, superstar. And other stanzas which repeat the Hosanna, hey, Zanas. But hey, JC, you're all right with me. 
Hosanna, hey, Zana. Hey, JC, won't you fight for me? Hosanna, hey, Zana. Hey, JC, won't you die for me? Hosanna, hey, Zana. And it is the crowds, the crowds that greet Jesus as he enters the city of Jerusalem, the city of David. And in the Gospel of John, they are waving the branches, not putting them on the ground, but they're waving them, greeting Jesus, shouting loud hosannas. The book of Matthew echoes the blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In the book of Luke, he says there were no palm branches waved, but a lot of cloak laying on the ground. And they were preparing a pathway for the Messiah. And with these loud hosannas, translated into help us, save us, shouted by the crowds. We can only wonder what they were thinking because even with the different variations of readings from these Palm Sunday texts, one thing always remained constant, that Jesus rode into the town on an animal that resembles one of his own entering into this world, on an animal that was well known as a beast of burden, Some say a donkey, some say a colt, some say, some use other terminology. Uh, I'm not going to say that today. But so let's get back to this donkey. Even the synoptic gospels vary in description. Yet we still notice that all four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, go to great lengths to describe the procurement of this equine in question. According to today's text from Mark, When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter the village, you will find a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it to me. And if anybody says, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it. And and we will send it back here immediately. So they went away and they found a colt tied near a door, just like Jesus said, outside in the street. And as they were out untying the colt, of course, bystanders said, what are you doing? Why are you taking this colt? And of course, the disciples told them exactly what Jesus told them to say and said that we're going to bring it back. And so they allowed them to take it. And then when Jesus came in and processed into the town, they brought the, cloaks to Je- they brought the colt to Jesus and they threw their cloaks on the donkey or the colt, or the foal, and he sat on it. So no, no, I I, I don't think that the disciples stole the colt, or a young male donkey, as some may insinuate, but the thing is that this was far more than just a donkey ride into town. Jesus rolls into this truly beautiful, subversive ride, and he rides into Jerusalem, and his ministry would have had it no other way. If you are familiar with the book of Zechariah, then you would have recognized the prophecy and why Mark spent so many precious verses on the simple act of getting a donkey. Zechariah 9.9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he humble, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Many commentators have speculated that Mark emphasizes the detail of retrieving the donkey to give his readers, us, time to have ears to hear. The illusion of Zechariah's prophecy, the one who comes riding on a donkey, will non-violently bring peace. Now you see in those times, a triumphant military leader would not have come on a humble donkey to cut off the chariot, war horse and bow. But he would have come riding a chariot and a war horse and wielding a bow or other weapons to signify leadership in a time of war. But Jesus does differently. 
Historical scholar John Dominic Crisson reminds us that Jesus does not ride in on a stallion or a mare or a mule or a mule donkey, not even a female donkey. He rides the most unmilitary mount imaginable, a female nursing donkey with her little coat, colt trotting behind her. And that's in the Matthew version, which matches the rest of the Zechariah prophecy that the one who comes riding on a humble donkey into Jerusalem will nonviolently bring peace. This interpretation is even more convincing when you consider that historically triumphal entries into Jerusalem would have been exactly the opposite of what Mark, Matthew, and Zechariah described. Grisson notes that in 332 BCE, three centuries before Jesus' Palm Sunday entrance, Alexander the Great, having conquered Tyre and Gaza after terrible sieges, Jerusalem opened its gates without a fight. And we can imagine the victorious Alexander entering into Jerusalem on his famous war horse, the black stallion Bucephalus, as would the custom likely to have been for Pontius Pilate to make a similarly militaristic triumphal entry into Jerusalem with a war horse, with a chariot, with weapons, each year in the days of Passover to remind the pilgrims that Rome was in charge. Such a demonstration would have been especially pertinent at Passover, since Passover was explicitly a celebration of the liberation of Jews from the slavery in Egypt. Thus, Jesus' subversive donkey ride reminded all those waving the palm branches that Rome was the new Egypt and the emperor was the new Pharaoh. So what is the message that Jesus was preparing us for? Rome, the new emperor, the new Egypt, emperor, the new Pharaoh? Who is our new Egypt? Who is our new Pharaoh? Yesterday, I was listening to a piece on NPR interviewing musician Missy Mazzoli, whose 30-minute suite, Vespers for a New Dark Age, was commissioned by Carnegie Hall for the 2014 Ecstatic Music Festival, which incorporates, her, her music incorporates a distorted, wild, and she says blasphemous take on an ancient musical and religious tradition of the evening Vesper prayer service observed in many Orthodox, Catholic, Anglican, and Lutheran churches. And she creates a quite haunting musical gift about the world today with lyrics like, Hello, Lord, sorry I woke you because my plans are important to me and I need things no one can buy and don't even know what they are. I know I belong in this new dark age. Yet her message that she wants to leave her listeners is twofold. That even in a self-centered, selfish, and nar often narrow-minded world, this new dark age that we live in today also offers hope if humanity is willing to look for it. Today, perhaps not so much different from the ancient Near Eastern days of Christ, or even the dark ages with the bubonic plague, we live in a world that may seem dark and gloomy, with wars and violence that surrounds us on our TV sets and even in our own communities, where young black men are still accosted and even murdered by officers of the peace, when refugees must leave or are pushed out of their war-torn homelands because of genocide and greed, where airline atrocities throw thousands of lives into disorder, grief, and anger, where nurses, hotel workers, custodians, and other laborers are treated unfairly by their employers, where fracking and deforestation destroys more than communities, but animal habitats and environments, when we waste our natural resources and offer murder and destroy to get what we want, in a world that cries out for help and forgiveness. Hosanna, Hosanna, God save us, God help us, Hosanna. And God sent a man 
to town on a donkey. And so we impart on the next phase of the journey. We cannot be Easter people without going through Holy Week first. And Palm Sunday is part of that journey. And why? Because God's message has always been about forgiveness and love. This morning when Kevin read Psalms 118, it reminds us over and over and over again about the radical message that God's steadfast love endures forever. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. And in God's steadfast love that endures forever, we are still reminded that even through a celebration of a Messiah to come, how quickly crowds can turn. Yet God's love and forgiveness maintain, even through the most ultimate of sacrifices. One of my good friends, Reverend Allison English, posted on her Facebook page this week, this is the sixth time I have preached the Palm Passion Sunday in my career as a priest. I've done it six out of seven years. Every year I struggle with this Sunday. This year I think I'm finally getting to what my deal is. I think I just hate that the crowds wind up crucifying Jesus and that I am a part of that crowd every year, no matter what. Somehow it took me seven years and six sermons to start figuring this out. Yes, we are part of the crowds. The crowd that cheers Jesus on, looking for a Savior, looking for hope, someone to save us and to help us. Hosanna. And yet, it is also possible that some of us are part of the crowd that also shouts, crucify him, crucify him. And then again, there is a part of each of us that goes with Christ to the cross as well. And we are not always part of the same crowds. And certainly we do not want to be recognized as a part of the crowd that yells, crucify him. Don't we all want to stand on the side of solidarity with Jesus? But we know that we are all capable of turning at the drop of a hat because that is part of our human condition and our humanity. But that is also why we have been given this opportunity year after year to walk with Jesus to the cross. But we know he doesn't stay there. Always the radical, we find Jesus making broad, increasingly public, and controversial demonstrations in the big city of Jerusalem, in the middle, right in the middle of Passover, the height of the pilgrimage season. In contrast to making controversial teachings in the small towns and villages around Galilee. I don't think Jesus wanted to die but I believe that his passion for justice, his passion for the people, and his anger at injustice was a passion and anger he inherited from the Hebrew prophets before him that led him to take increasingly large risks to show the contrast between the status quo and the kingdom of God. These risky acts of nonviolent activism led directly to Jesus' tragic martyrdom. But he invites us. We are invited to walk with other crowds, filling it with the message of Christ. Today, you have been invited to a Palm Sunday celebration. This afternoon, you are invited to Pasadena's Peace March, meeting at Messiah Lutheran at 3 p.m. We are invited all week long to be in contemplative prayer in our labyrinth that will be set up in our fellowship hall during Holy Week. We are invited to the table as Jesus serves his last Passover meal with his disciples in the upper room on Thursday. We are invited to the cross 
on Friday. We are invited to be part of a prayer walk on Holy Saturday around our Pasadena community, which our confirmation class beta tested for you yesterday. And in all these things, in this Holy Week, it invites us to make both public declarations of our faith, at the same time also making our private intercessions and confessions to God, requesting God's love and forgiveness. Progressive theologian Carl Gregg says, this does not mean that we all literally need to die on the cross, but that we can walk the way of the cross. Rosa Parks is an imitator of Christ, not because she suffered for taking her stand or keeping her seat in her case, but because she had the courage to believe in her own dignity and fought for it in spite of the conflict that resulted. Nelson Mandela was an imitator of Christ, not because he suffered in prison, but because he held out for peace and justice and led a nation to resurrection. In each case, it is not the suffering that is redemptive, but the courage of justice to pursue justice in the face of pain and evil. So let us let Palm Sunday be Palm Sunday as we need to journey through our own holy weeks to get to Easter. Perhaps it is selfish motives on my part, but it always seems like we're always anticipating the next part to happen, or we, have, or we think we already know the end of the story, <clears throat> Andy. But I have no desire to want to push forward through the week because I know what is coming. What is coming is the passion that love story of God, Christ's ultimate death. But there is also a resurrection to look forward to. But we need to remember, to experience, to understand why we have to go through death and gain new life again. This holy week, I invite you to remember Christ's humble entry into the city of Jerusalem to remember Mark's story, to remember Jesus' story as it continues to haunt us, to challenge us, and to inspire us as we discern how God is calling us today in our time and in our place to follow Jesus' risky way of nonviolent activism, loving kindness, and gracious compassion on our way to becoming Easter people. Amen and amen.